go. Uh, we'll go ahead and start by setting yeah. our motivation. Okay. And so just take a minute and ground yourself present in your body, present in the space. And think, may all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from desire for friends and hatred for enemies. And if you'd like to bring in the Tonglen meditation from last session, feel that on the in-breath, all sentient beings free from suffering and the causes of suffering. Out breath, all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. So just in breath, compassion, out breath, love. Just marry those two ideas to your breath for a few breaths. In breath, compassion, out breath, love. And then adding refuge in bodhicitta. Sange chudon sogi chunamba, jan chil padu dani kapsuchi, dagi chun yangi pe sonamgi, drola penji sange drupa sho sange chudon sogi chunamba. Janchu padu dani gapsuchi, dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi, drola penchia sange drupa sho. Okay, so seven point mind training, Lo Jong, thought transformation, that's where we're at. We've been looking at the conventional awakening mind. So we've been looking at bodhicitta from the perspective of an ordinary person who has not yet realized reality directly. And so I guess what's important to remember is that all of the good work that we do, all of the kind attitudes we develop, all of the motivations that we have in this life have a little bit of a veil. Yeah, we don't totally see the way people, ourselves, situations, and objects exist. And so we're really making a stab in the dark. We're really making an educated guess about what is actually helpful. And yet, wanting to be helpful is huge positive karma, which helps create that mental momentum to be able to pierce through the veil, to be able to eventually realize reality directly. So it's a catch-22, isn't it? Because you want to do the right thing, but who knows what the right thing is in any context? Who knows what's going to be useful to someone? You know, if giving food to the hungry is a good idea, it seems like a good idea. It seems so simple. But is giving food to the hungry something that will empower them? Is it something that will enable some sort of dependency? Is it something that will ha they'll have an allergic reaction? Is it something that will make them feel looked down on? Or is it just a nice thing to do because someone's hungry, give them food? You know, like life is complicated. You know, we think that we know a simple, straightforward action we can do to help. And so a lot of our life is trying to find systems and patterns and plans to do the right thing. And I think whenever we're doing Dharma practice, we have to remember that we're making an educated guess. And we want that educated guess to get more and more educated. 
but really what we're working on is our mental attitudes. Whatever actions of body and of speech flow from that may or may not be effective. Yeah, we need to change the direction of our plans. Our plans are usually, what do I do out there? And then, oh, how shall I be? And when really it should be, how shall I be? How shall I connect? How shall I motivate? And then given my common sense, here's what I'm going to do may or may not work because I don't have all the information. Do you understand? Right, with, so with Lojong, you're really trying to organize the way you think much more precisely, much more effectively, and you're likely to be more useful in the world. You're likely to be of more benefit to others. But there's no guarantee because you really don't know all the information. And this can make us feel a little bit crazy or a little bit paralyzed, like, how can I act? How can I do anything if I don't know all the pieces? But if you can sit with that feeling of ambiguity, that feeling of restlessness, groundlessness, and say, what I can control a little is my own mind. Let me train my own mind. Let me train my heart. They are the same word in Tibetan, heart-mind. Let me train this heart-mind to be open and compassionate and loving. Let me train it to be undistracted. And if I can do that, I'm likely to really be of benefit in this world and create that kind of ripple effect for the people that are receptive to it. So I guess this is just to launch us by saying training the mind means training the mind. It doesn't mean success in the outside world, though it may lead to that. It doesn't mean that suddenly you'll be able to fix all your relationships, though it probably will help. It means that immediately you have access to more peace of mind. And the more peace of mind you're able to stay in, the more creative you can be the more flexible you can be and the easier it is for you to access your own wisdom in the moment. So starting with yourself first is really the invitation of mind training. Start with your own motivation first. What is the best motivation? Bodhicitta from our perspective. What is Bodhicitta? The mind seeking enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. But don't forget that you are in the group of all sentient beings. It's not all sentient beings except you. It's all sentient beings, including you. And that you are as deserving of love and affection and care and compassion as anyone else seems to go without saying. But sometimes when we're getting into this altruistic headspace, we're very much, no, 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 you first. No, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And we can even get a weird kind of pride about our own difficulties in life and not want to disclose them to people. Have you ever been in this space where you're like the helper, the strong one, the efficient one, the supportive one? And then if someone says, how are you? And you're actually struggling a bit, you're a bit affronted. You don't want to say. You're like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. And you're almost a little annoyed. Don't ask me how I am. I'm the helper. <laughs> Don't ask me who I, how I am. I'm the strong one. You know, and it's, it's really interesting to kind of examine the role pride plays in our positive actions. And the role pride plays in our sense of isolation and separation and alienation and loneliness from others. Because we never let them in. We never said, you know what, actually my back really hurts today and it's making me a little distracted. Ugh, how are you? You know, you're not making a whole story. You're not making a whole song and dance. You're not loading it on people, but you're being honest. Here are the things that are affecting my mind right now. Yeah, so this is all to say when you're organizing your motivation, there has to be this very, very deep authenticity with where you actually are married together with how you want to live. And if you're pretending that you're already at this idealized bodhisattva lifestyle, then you will become unbearable to be around. Yeah, you will become so hard, so cringe, 
very sweet, very polite, very helpful, but no one can touch your heart. There'll be this distance between you always. And you'll get more and more defensive of protecting that distance, even as you feel more and more disconnected and disillusioned from others. So what blocks our bodhicitta is self-cherishing. And the self-cherishing attitude is what drives pride, is what drives jealousy. It drives our attachment, our anger. And of course, all of this comes from ignorance. So we're circling back to the veil, the veil of ignorance that covers reality. This is why we need ultimate bodhicitta, not just relative bodhicitta. So that's the advertisement for the next session. The next session is going to be all ultimate bodhicitta. Okay, so if you want ultimate bodhicitta, you have to come to next week. This week, <laughs> we're going to go more into conventional bodhicitta. So we're in um, how to train in the conventional awakening mind, and we've gone through the Tonglen verses, and now we're to this section that says, concerning the three objects, three poisons, and three virtues, the instruction to be followed in brief is to take these words to heart in all activities. So three, three, and three, you know, Buddhists love a list, right? We love a list. All right, so the three objects are friends, enemies, neutrals, or strangers. The three poisons are passion, aggression, and ignorance or delusion. The three seeds of virtue are the absence of passion, aggression, and ignorance. Passion in the sense of attachment, right? Um, uh, exaggeration, expectation, that attachment guide. This particular translator has called it passion or desire. So the practice of this slogan is to take the passion, aggression, and delusion of ourselves, of others upon ourselves so that they may be free and undefiled. Passion is wanting to magnetize or possess. Aggression is wanting to reject, attack, cast out. Ignorance or indifference is that you can't be bothered. You're not interested. The anti-prajna or wisdom energy. So we take upon ourselves the aggression of our enemies, the passion of our friends, and the indifference of the neutrals. And this is a really interesting way of viewing these. This isn't how we normally approach something like equanimity. This is kind of radical. Okay, so friends, enemies, strangers. Normally, when we have friends, enemies, strangers, we think, okay, Buddha would say, try and have unbiased goodwill. Yeah? Recognize the labels, come from your side, try and have unbiased goodwill. Try and see the perspective that the stranger is someone's best friend, your friend someone else feels some annoyance towards, your enemy might be someone else's dearest loved one. All of these labels come from our own side, based on context, in any case, goodwill, right? Classic equanimity. Right? Or you think about the way the labels change moment to moment and someone who was a stranger became a friend, yada, yada, yada. We know about equanimity, but in this context, we're looking at how do we relate to their afflictions? It's not about the preventative for ours. Normally, equanimity, you know, when there's a friend, we try and prevent attachment from arising. When there's an enemy, we try and prevent anger from arising. When there's a stranger, we try to prevent indifference from arising. But in this case, this is like next level. This is like pro-level equanimity, where we're engaging with their negative states of mind, not ours. But in so doing, we manage ours. So we go back to this commentary by Chigim Trumpa. It's quite interesting. We take the delusions of others upon ourselves so that they may be free and undefiled so that they may be free and undefiled. What does that say to you right away? How do you take on their delusions in a way that's healthy and not weird? And can you anyway? We know about karma. What do you think he's pointing to? Take on their delusions so that they are free and undefiled. This seems to be in contradiction to the teachings on karma. This seems to be a terrible idea, <laughs> right? What do you think he means? Thoughts? Take on the delusions of others. What does it mean? 
be free of self-cherishing <laughs> yeah be free of self-cherishing yeah yeah there's yeah that's going a good direction yeah joanne yeah it sounds a little bit like tong len like mm -hmm. a version of that it is it's the next level tong len normally tong len we're taking the suffering right we're taking the suffering and giving it to our self cherishing here we're actually taking the causes of suffering which are the delusions so the attitude in daily life really is is pretty straightforward it's just when people dump their garbage on you don't take it but take it right normally the way we take it is we give it as fuel to our own garbage rubbish we're in australia rubbish <laughs> so what usually happens is someone is full of attachment about something like an object or a food or a situation or another person and it can activate our attachment yeah we think no i want to go first no i need that no they're my friend i want their attention their attachment triggers our attachment or if someone's really angry and in a terrible mood it's contagious and there's like a domino of bad moods. Now you're grumpy because they were grumpy. Now you're giving grumpiness to other people because you're in a grump, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Or if you're in a crowd of strangers and everyone's indifferent and sort of ignoring each other, you take that on board. Yeah? As if it's inevitable. As if you had no choice in the matter, forgetting that there are times when you've been in crowds of strangers where everyone was in a good mood and you all were relating to each other as friends who hadn't met yet. Or times when you saw someone who was very angry, but you knew why, so you went in with patience. Or those times you were with someone who is very attached to something, say it was a small child, and you just held the space for them while they calmed down. So the first thing is to acknowledge that we feel like our responses are inevitable. We feel like our reactions are natural and necessary when all they are is habitual. They're just habits, right? They're just habits. And a lot of them are habits that have not served us well. So what this verse is telling us is what you could do is take on their negative states of mind in the sense of non-reactivity. Yeah, not let their garbage fuel your garbage or their rubbish fuel your, fuel your rubbish, right? You take it on and say, actually, I can be big enough to hold what just happened and not react with a delusion, which doesn't mean like getting energetically spongy. It's not that. You know, when you're with someone with, with a big, big emotion, say it's grief, and you haven't gone in grounded, you can be really tired being with someone in their grief. Yeah, and you can kind of feel like it's depleting your life force, or you can start to feel kind of sucked dry. Yeah, if you didn't go into the situation grounded, it has that effect. We're not inviting that. We're not saying take on the delusion and let it suck you dry. Not that. We're saying, is there a way you can act as kind of like a filtration system? And they were the big heavy smoke of a bushfire, and you were the brilliant newly engineered filtration system that could make good clean air come out of it. Yeah, or maybe even if you've ever been to uh, Chandra Kurti Center in New Zealand on the South Island, they have the most beautiful compost toilets you have ever seen. They have stained glass. They smell of cedar. It's amazing. I don't know how they engineered them, but it's like you're taking their crap and making it into beautiful compost. <laughs> yeah, and that compost on the other end is rich and vibrant and full of nutrients and doesn't smell at all like that. Yeah, so you're not just taking their garbage and making it worse for yourself. You're doing a transformative thing of saying, actually, this horrible thing that they're experiencing and dumping on me and dumping on other people is very useful. I want it. I actually want it. I don't want them to be in a negative state of mind. I don't want that cosmically. But I do want this experience because it will build the strength and resilience I need to better benefit others. So I'm going to take it and give it to my self-cherishing thought. 
Yeah, so you both were going the right direction. It's It's got the Tonglen vibe. It's got the overcoming, self-cherishing vibe. But it's harder to take on afflictions than it is to take on suffering. Yeah. Taking on suffering, you don't really want people to suffer. Their afflictions, you're kind of like, could you just not? <laughs> could you just not with the affliction? Could you just get yourself under control? You know, you don't have that immediate like, oh, I want to take it from you. You know, even if it's your good friend, you're just like, could you cut it out? I don't want you to be in this mood. This mood is problematic and it's not your best side. But what if you're like, actually, you being in this mood helps me confront my own assumptions about how I need you to be and my own expectations of how you should behave and how that relates to my own happiness. Because again and again, these teachings on Lojong are pointing out that we objectify others. Again and again, it's pointing out that we are seeing people as objects to give us happiness or to be pushed away because they give us suffering or to be ignored because they do nothing for us. They are objects to us when we're operating through the lens of self-cherishing. And we need that veil to fall because they're not objects, they're sentient beings, they're human beings, they have been our mother countless times, they are full of Buddha nature, they are struggling, we are interconnected, yada, 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 right? These things are so important and we forget it. We treat them like chocolate, yeah? I would like more of that delicious version of you. Or if they switch, you're like, oh, you're like cheese that's gone off, get away. You know, it's like they're not objects, they're people. They're not there to serve you. They don't exist to entertain you. The, and then being annoying or harmful or whatever you don't like about them isn't about you. Yeah, <laughs> and we know this. And yet somehow in a conversation with people, there's just this part of us that takes everything personally and makes ourselves the main character of every story. We're either the victim or we're the hero, we're the helper, we're the ignored, but we're the main character. And it makes sense that we are to ourselves, but if you're looking at yourself from a bird's eye view, you would see that you are equal. And that equality is relaxing. It's a lot of effort to be the main character. It takes a lot of attention, a lot of thought to build that narrative, to describe yourself to yourself all day, every day, to describe what's happening to you. And, and now the hero enters the grocery store. You know, like we don't say it like that, but there is a part of us that is witnessing our own life as if a voiceover in a movie. And that is not mindfulness. Yeah, it can be um, something that can happen is that when you start trying to be mindful is that you become more self-conscious. And that's not what's being asked of us with mindfulness. If mindfulness is making you more self-conscious, more defensive, more critical of others, it's been misunderstood. Or if it's completely passive and just like, I am sitting, I am sitting, I am drinking tea, I am drinking tea, that also is not useful. It can build concentration and that's nice, but not in the efficient way that's being asked of us in Lojong. Lojong says, may your mindfulness be accompanied by bodhicitta. Watch yourself, yes, but not through the lens of being the main character, through the lens of the awakening mind of bodhicitta. Then you're like, okay, this sentient being who happens to be you is now working in this way or thinking in this way, even more importantly. How am I thinking? And is my thinking of benefit to others? Is my thinking in alignment with my spiritual path? Is my motivation touching my deepest values? And if not, you just notice that and you adjust kind of automatically. Because you already have values, you already have ethics, you already have things that are important to you. But when you're having mindfulness with the lens of bodhicitta, that very self-awareness triggers a realignment. Yeah. 
So make sure that when you're practicing mindfulness, you're doing it in the way that's actually effective. Because when you start really getting into advanced Buddhism, and Lojong is advanced Buddhism, even though it's intellectually fairly easy, when you get into the practices that are more advanced like this, it shows you yourself in a way that can be very confronting. And then you implode or explode. Yeah, you get kind of embarrassed and self-conscious and cringe and worry that people are noticing your weaknesses or your inconsistencies and hypocrisy. Or you explode or you get forwardly oriented and you start nitpicking everybody. And you start pointing out their faults and getting more and more critical of them as a defense mechanism. You know, it's like psych 101, right? It's psychology 101. And yet we've it can be heightened when you add mindfulness to the mix of the things going on in your mind. So doing it from a perspective of bodhicitta. Do you guys have thoughts so far or questions so far? Oh, I was just saying, I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to, but thanks. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it does. It's yeah. yeah. Do you feel like the more the more you study the Dharma, the more you have to go back to the beginning? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Jai, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, my apologies for being late. I messed up on the time change. Um, okay, my question is this, and I've actually emailed it to you. I get befuddled when I'm dealing with corporations and I'm dealing with large government situations, right? It's like, if I was to be upset with an individual, I have ways that I can pull on. It's this amorphous conglomerate that uh, I find I, I've got no techniques to sort of channel bodhicitta toward them. So, and I know, you know, like I've been listening to a lot of different talks about on the topic. It's obviously was nothing that was really addressed very heavily uh, a couple thousand years ago. So um, just wondering where we're up to now in the 21st century is anything you can offer on that. Thank you. On dealing with with big, big groups of people. Yes, in because you don't have individuals to focus on. For me, it's like, and and yeah, it's just so, I it's, my brain is, has a hard time getting around trying to do what I know I need to do, what is the good thing to do, because it's like, it doesn't, it feels like this thing doesn't really exist. It's this amorphous mass yeah. of, yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm with you. And you know, and the, this isn't as new a problem as, as it might seem. And there, there's a whole really interesting text called Nagarjuna's Letter to a Friend, which he wrote to a king about the best ways of governance. Um, and it's a really interesting text if you ever want to Google it, Nagajuna's letter to a friend. But um, when we talk about large organizations, I think it's a little bit like how we look at traffic. Yeah, when we're like looking at a mass of traffic, I was thinking of, I don't know, like be, you know, in, in Sydney, you know, King's Cross, you know, rush hour, and it's just like chock-a-block and there's people everywhere. It feels like a mass of obstacles. It doesn't feel like a group of people, especially when they're in cars, right? Because that it blocks the personalization of them. But you know what happens when you're in traffic, especially if you're driving in traffic and you're looking into the windows and seeing the people in their cars and looking, and it's like suddenly you're not stuck in traffic, we're stuck in traffic. Yeah, suddenly we occurs to you. And so the, similarly with government organizations or big corporations, they are a mass of individuals. And sometimes that mass of individuals can take on groupthink or like culty weirdness or problematic policies. That is absolutely true, but they did not come out of nowhere. That was the decision of a group of individuals that then you take to be the way it exists. And just like with traffic if you can start to look through the windows and see the individuals you can start to see where there might be areas where change is possible 
you know, like when you're looking and someone waves you in because you're trying to make a right hand turn or a left hand turn and like, no, no, come in. You wouldn't have known if you hadn't looked through the windows and seen the individuals in there and met their eyes and had an interaction. And there's something about breaking up our feeling of groups into realizing that they become like a school of fish, but a school of fish from a distance looks like one big mass, but there's a whole bunch of little individual fish there. And if you really can nudge a couple of them, the whole group will go that way. Yeah, if you attract it over here or nudge it over there, the whole mass will move. And so it becomes like good community organizing that nonprofits do in a grassroots way of find the individuals you can build relationship with in those giant masses. And that actually can have that ripple effect where change starts to move. And I guess never underestimate the power of relationship. Never underestimate the power of relationship. And so whatever you can do, even if it's in a tiny situation, like a family group or a coworker situation of just consciously, how do I build relationships? One person at a time, it starts to set tone, which starts to color the whole group which then has its own ripple effect. It just takes a few people doing it on purpose. Yeah, rather than just kind of being buffeted by the mass. If one little fish was like, no, let's go this way. The rest of the fish would be like, are we going this way? Yeah, all right. <laughs> you know, but there has to be something in it for them. And really what's in it for most people is connection at the deepest, deepest level. Of course, afflictions will, you know, trigger them, greed and blah, blah, blah. But if you can get to a few people's hearts, that is the way. It's slower, but it's much more sustainable. So whatever that looks like in our own individual lives, never underestimate the power of relationship. Yeah. Make them, find them, build them, reinforce them. Don't take them for granted you know, the people in your life that you do get on well with, don't let it slide, don't get complacent, like, check on them. But also, we can have more people in our life than we do right now. It's just we're not used to making friends as adults, right? Or especially in groups or organizations where we don't have immediate connection, where there's not as many points of relation. So those are just some thoughts. Um, see that that mass is not just a giant lump. It's a whole bunch of minds that all have Buddha nature. And I bet you have the karma to get through to a couple of them. And then they have the karma to get through to a couple more. And so it goes. So slowly, slowly, but on purpose. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Is it, how does that sit? Do you feel objections? No, actually I don't. It uh, opens up a pathway for me and that's what I, I want. You know, I'm really, um, a strong suit of mine is quite frankly bodhicitta, right? Not wisdom, <laughs> but um, yeah, it has surprised me how little I've been able to actualize in this area. And um, this is what I want to do um, most, you know, most definitely, because this is the area that I see where I have the most upset and uh, I need to address that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, because we only have a few sessions, um, I'm not going to go through every tiny bit, but I this point three of transforming adverse circumstances into the path to enlightenment. This is really the heart of Lojong, transforming adverse circumstances into the path to enlightenment. So what this can sound like is positive thinking. Yeah, and it can sound really cringe. What it can sound like is like affirmations. Remember affirmations in the 80s, right? Or 90s, yeah, and you look in the mirror and you're like, I am intelligent and competent. And it's like, oh God, please, no. And it's very American. And I apologize on behalf of my people. Um, 
you know, this is not what we're talking about with transforming adverse circumstances. We are genuinely naming them as adverse. This is not what I wanted. This weather, this economic disaster, this whatever, whatever, you know, relationship breakdown, whatever. This is not what I wanted. One beat, two beat, three beats. This is not what I wanted. This is not what I wanted, but it's what I want. Yeah, so you have to stay there for realness. You have to own, no, I didn't want this to happen. I didn't want this to happen. I didn't want to break my ankle. I didn't want to get cancer. I didn't want my husband to leave me. I didn't want whatever it is. Let yourself feel that. And then say, and that very feeling and that very resistance and that very obstacle is the fuel I need to crack open my heart even further and release it from the prison of self-cherishing. Every single hardship opens up pathways of empathy for me to understand my fellow man. And without suffering, there is no determination to be free. There is no renunciation without remembering suffering. Suffering can act as a mindfulness bell that wakes you up. So, you're wanting to transform adverse circumstances into the path to enlightenment. So the first invitation is to think when the environment and its inhabitants overflow with unwholesomeness, transform adverse circumstances into the path to enlightenment. Apply meditation immediately at every opportunity. Yeah, apply meditation immediately at every opportunity it means every opportunity. You're bored, how can I use it? You're angry, how can I use it? You're sad, how can I use it? At every opportunity. And it becomes a really interesting exercise to immediately plug in your daily life into the big picture of the path to enlightenment, because then you're not just struggling getting through the day. Now it actually can have some meaning and some purpose, even a mundane day. Yeah, with nothing in particular happening. How can I open my heart to others through the knowledge of what's happening to me? So the supreme method is accompanied by the four practices. So this group is connected with the paramita or perfection of patience. So the definition of patience is forbearance or forbearance with suffering. So whatever happens, you don't react to it. Doesn't mean you can't respond, right? But don't react. The obstacle to patience is aggression or anger. Patience does not mean biding your time and trying to slow down in and of itself, right? Impatience arises when you become too sensitive and you don't have any way to deal with your environment, your atmosphere. You feel very touchy, very sensitive. So the paramita of patience is often described as a suit of armor. Patience has a sense of dignity and forbearance. You are not so easily disturbed by the world's aggression. So when you mentally prepare, you're already able to do this in lots of situations and maybe don't give yourself credit for it. When you mentally prepare, you can cope with a great deal. When you're ungrounded and not present, you get kind of thrown. So one thing about meditation is it really brings you into the present, and then you're very much able to cope with life. And so if you can think of some situation that is chaos, some situation that is chaos that you cope with just fine. Yeah, it could be a big gaggle of grandchildren. Yeah, bouncing off the walls, you know, like it's raining outside, all the children are inside, they're going stir crazy, they're bored, they're restless, but you kind of knew it going in. You have a different type of patience than if that wasn't what you'd mentally prepared for. Yeah, can you imagine it? Like your nieces and nephews or your children's children or whatever it is, the whole bunch of kids in your house, rainy day, they're stuck inside, grumpy, they wanted to play outside. But you knew it was going to rain that day. And so you thought, all right, I'm going to have some board games. I'm going to have some craft. I'm going to have some games. I might resort to a movie, but I've got thoughts. 
Yeah. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Sometimes the kids will settle. Sometimes they won't. But you'd mentally prepared for chaos. And so you had the bandwidth to cope. Yeah. Do you know a situation like this, right? Or, you know, if you know you're going into rush hour, as opposed to when traffic suddenly spikes, but you weren't ready for it. It's the same amount of traffic, but because you were mentally prepared, it felt different. You know, for years and years, I was living at Chen Rezig Institute in Queensland, and then I was living in New Zealand, and the traffic was no big deal. And then I moved to Israel, and I had to drive into Tel Aviv at rush hour, and I had to switch back to driving on the right side of the road. And Israeli drivers are similar to Israeli people to make a coarse stereotype. So it's a lot. <laughs> and I love them very much, but it was a lot. And the first few times I was really anxious and I was really ungrounded and I would get to work and I would have such a tension headache and I'd need like 20 minutes to calm down. Now it's like, ah, whatever. Ah. Yeah, because now I'm mentally prepared. The traffic has not gotten better. And this is what we have to keep remembering. The situation does not have to get better for you to feel better. In fact, that was never the point. And actually, that hardship has given you something that you treasure. I treasure that I can drive in crazy traffic. That is a skill set I'm really happy I have. But it's not like I magically had it. I had to develop it. Yeah, you're not just magically good with your grandkids or magically good in this situation or that situation. It's a skill you developed. And that growth mindset is what we need to have well-being. Is to have this idea of if something is hard, it's new. It's not hard because I'm weak. It's not hard because I'm bad. It's not hard because I'm stupid. It's hard because it's new. And actually, I can build my strength to deal with anything. I just have to practice on purpose. And the first step is viewing it as something you practice on purpose. Not viewing it as a, I can't. <laughs> yeah. Therefore, I'm going to dodge and weave and escape and whatever. Yeah. So it, it's interesting to really think in those terms, to really think in terms of everything can be fuel for practice if I decide to make it fuel for practice. Anything can also be a hassle if I decide to make it a hassle. When self-cherishing is really, really up, even things you love to do aggravate you. Yeah. You could be going for a hike in the Blue Mountains, right? You could be standing and looking at the Three Sisters at that beautiful outlook, and you could know that there's going to be a bus full of tourists, but then they come and you're like, oh, well, they just shut up and stop with their selfies, <laughs> right? You already knew, and you were going to enjoy the view because it's a beautiful view, but you've ruined it for yourself. Yeah, you're going to stop and get a coffee, you're going to sit quietly in a cafe. What a nice day. Your good friends are there. And then like you've got one wobbly chair and it's enough to ruin your whole event. Yeah, your chair is wobbly. We'll stick a napkin under it, like sort it out, let it go. But you know, when you're in that kind of mood, anything can aggravate you. Yeah. Whereas when you've set your motivation correctly, very little will get to you. You might not even notice the wobbly chair if you're in a good enough mood. And if you're in a bad enough mood, just the tag on your collar is enough to ruin your day. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So <laughs> gently, gently, but like sort of like taking the reins of your own experience without talking over the top of the suffering that does arise. And that delicate dance is what we're talking about here in Lojong. Because you can be like, oh, the tag is itching me. Flip it down. Moving on. <laughs> right? You're not pretending that it's not there. You're being practical. So whatever misfortunes <laughs> befall you, whether caused by living beings or by the elements, are the fruits of your own past negative actions. Karma. Misfortunes are viewed as adversities and obstacles by those unfamiliar with Dharma. But for someone who has entered the gateway of Dharma, 
the master said. They are exactly like what Chekawa explained. If someone has mind training, all of this, physical illness and mental suffering, becomes a skillful means through which you receive the blessings and higher attainments of the teachers and the three jewels. Therefore, transform every circumstance into a factor that instills in you the awakening mind. You're looking also at what is refuge? What is refuge? What is refuge? What am I taking refuge in? What am I taking refuge from? What do I do habitually? What is actually useful? This becomes a very good question. What actually protects you from suffering? Is it covering yourself in cotton balls? No, <laughs> right? Is it really making your life so easy and efficient and well-planned? That can help, but you know, the best laid plans. So what you're really trying to understand is that what protects you from suffering is the Dharma that you have integrated. Not the Dharma in the abstract, not the teachings out there on the bookshelf, it's what you have integrated, what you have made personal, what you have thought of again and again, such that the penny has dropped. You get it fundamentally, so much so that you couldn't unlearn it if you tried. That's how familiar we need to get with some of these Dharma ideas. Lots of them you've agreed with and loved for years, but you have to keep coming back to them for them to stick. Yeah, it's like my, my own teacher always says, when you've understood, then you can begin. Not when you've understood, then you're finished. When you've understood, you can begin. And when you've agreed and understood and experienced, well done, but just keep going over it. <laughs> you know, you're walking the dog, remind yourself. You're washing the dishes, remind yourself. Don't lose the lessons of your life. You want them to stick. So repeat, repeat, repeat. The repeating isn't because you don't already know. You do already know. That's good, but that's the beginning, not the end. Any questions so far about this approach? Or all things to add? Um, I'm not sure how to put this, but I'm a very visual person, and when I do Tong Lin, I can do the, the dark cloud and this and that and sending out light. But trying to give it to the self-cherishing self, mm. it's kind of, I can't visualise it. I, I take it in it, into the centre of my chest and I, I do it in the pause in the in and out breath, and then I send out the light and everything, and I feel it, but I... I'm struggling with trying to give it to the self-cherishing self um, in a way that feels like it's landed. Um, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There, there's a few approaches, um, and you pick whichever one works for you, but the classic approach is to visualize that self-cherishing takes the form of like a shell. And that shell covers your good, kind heart center, not your physical heart, but like your heart chakra. Mm -hmm. And you think that at your heart center is like warm golden light, which is your beautiful, good heart, your kindness, your compassion, your bodhicitta, everything. Mm -hmm. And that it's covered or suffocated or blocked by a hard shell, like yeah. the shell of cake. And so as you breathe in that toxic, black, heavy air, that black toxic heavy air slowly dissolves it right. or it turns into a thundercloud and lightning strikes and cracks it oh, so that's either that's a good... yeah thank you yeah yeah it's helpful to you know some people are visual some people are verbal so you know for some people just thinking the words compassion love compassion mm -hmm. love really works for some people you really need the imagery so the real suggestion for Tonglen that I have for you guys is use as much elaboration as keeps you perky and alert but not tense don't feel like you need to load every breath with absolutely everything you've ever learned about Tonglen load it with as much as your mind can happily carry without getting stressed and if it's gotten 
such that you're almost bored or it's too easy, then you can layer in another layer of elaboration. Yeah, so just kind of keeping it at whatever level keeps you sharp and alert. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and for some people, breath meditation of any kind is uh, tricky, right? So breath meditation is a go-to for so many meditations, but if for some reason, focusing on the breath for mindfulness, to let distractions subside, or for Tonglen, isn't good for you because you have some trauma stuff or some anxiety lives in your upper chest or for whatever reason just release focusing on the breath and just think of the visualization coming in and out in kind of a mass like through your pores in and out you mm -hmm. can think of that that's fine too right thank you yeah yeah thanks guys thanks, so let's do uh like a five minute break and then we'll do a meditation Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> Her full name is Fluffy McFluffkins Esquire. Um, yes, it could be a Dharma name, but it's <laughs> not. <laughs> it's not. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> She's indignant now to have been put on film without her consent. Sorry, darling. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, so let's get into meditation posture. And we're going to do Tonglen in this other form, this um, taking on the afflictions as opposed to the suffering. While we wait for folks to gather, we'll just review that, right? So we're doing three objects, three poisons, three seeds of virtue. So the three objects, friends, enemies, and neutrals. Three poisons, passion, aggression, and ignorance. Three seeds of virtue are the absence of passion, aggression, and ignorance. So we're taking upon ourselves the aggression of our enemies, the passion of our friends, and the indifference of our neutrals. But we're taking it on to the self-cherishing attitude and destroying it. Okay, so get yourself a nice straight posture. And you can take a few deep breaths if that helps you ground yourself. If you need to fidget for a second getting yourself into a balance. Just be in the body. And as you're present with your body, see if you can Release any tension that you might be carrying physically. Just through the power of your mind, bringing compassion to your own physicality. And then bring your focus back to your motivation. Refuge, bodhicitta, revive them to yourself. And then take a minute and let your mind shift to analysis and think of a good friend, one that pops into mind easily. Just picture them. Maybe your best friend or your spouse. Someone you see 
often or have easy affection for, just think of one person to represent friend. And as you think of this person, this close one, think of some of their attachment. Maybe neediness, maybe cravings. Just think about how they are when attachment has arisen, whether to an object, a person, or a situation. Just think about what their attachment is like. And as you think of their attachment, allow yourself to not like it. Allow yourself to know that it's not the most pleasant thing to be around. When they get really fixated on a certain plan, or they get obsessed with a person, or they have to buy an object, or they get really needy with you, whatever it is, just let yourself acknowledge this is not your favorite trait of your loved one. Describe that to yourself. And then say to yourself, this negative state of mind of my loved one, this attachment, came from the self-cherishing thought, their self-cherishing thought. My negative reaction to it is coming from my self-cherishing thought. I could make a bad situation worse, or I could avoid, or I could do something different this time. What if I decided this negative state of mind, their attachment, their passions, their obsessions, their neediness, all the things of that category are actually very useful to me? They show me how I might have objectified them. They're showing me what attachment looks like. They're showing me all sorts of things. And so this very trait or mood or behavior in them that I don't like, may I take it on voluntarily and give it to my self-cherishing thought. And may I give them happiness, comfort, well-being. And so imagine breathing in their attachment as heavy, dark, polluted smoke that you take on voluntarily, even though it's disgusting. And you give it to that hard shell of self-cherishing that blocks your good heart. 
That toxic smoke weakens it. That hard shell makes that shell soften. And on the outbreath, more and more of your love released, sent, given. In black smoke, out golden light. In, take on their attachment. Out, give them love. Again and again. Each cycle of breath, weakening yourself, cherishing, increasing your cherishing others. Take on their attachment, their passions, their neediness, their obsessions and cravings. Give your happiness, stability, well-being, contentment. And now shift and think of an enemy or someone you very much don't like, someone you have aversion towards. It doesn't have to be the worst one in your life, but just someone where affection does not come easily, where the opposite happens and you want them away from you whenever you see them. Maybe they trigger you. Just think of a person like that in your life. Aversion arises. One person to represent all those you have aversion towards. And without falling into the story, let yourself acknowledge that you don't particularly like them. Or maybe even stronger than that. Being real with yourself and how you feel about them.
And as you think of them, particularly think of their anger. They may have any number of afflictions that arise and annoy you or harm you. But just choose anger. What is it like when they're angry? Are they passive aggressive, silent treatment, withholding affection? Are they aggressive aggressive, yelling, toxic? What is their anger like? Critical, irritable? divisive, whatever it's like, just describe it to yourself. What is the anger of your enemy like? Maybe their anger looks like a general discontent and grumpiness. Maybe it's violent. Maybe it's dark and depressed. Maybe it seethes, accompanied by jealousy or pride. But as you think of the way their anger is, let yourself acknowledge that you don't like it. That whatever this anger looks like in your enemy is not particularly what you want to happen or to be in your life. Let yourself recognize that without falling into the story. Just know the impact they have. And you think, I don't like this. I don't want this in my life. Sometimes I don't want them in my life. I don't like this. And think, this behavior, this attitude, this affliction came from the self-cherishing thought, their self-cherishing thought, driven by ignorance self-grasping. My reaction and reactivity and aversion came from my self-cherishing thought and my ignorance self-grasping. My feeling about them is not inevitable. And just because it arises naturally doesn't mean it's necessary. So maybe their anger is just what I need. Maybe the toxic stew that they emit is the most useful thing.
And so imagine breathing in your enemy's anger in the form of heavy, dark, polluted smoke and give it to your self-cherishing attitude, that hard shell covering your good heart that feels like protection, but actually creates barriers and distance, blocks the flow of happiness and love. You might even thank them for their anger how wonderfully toxic it is. This will weaken my self-cherishing thought. Thank you. And on the out breath, sending happiness, contentment, wisdom, like warm golden light. And let this ride on the breath. In black smoke, out golden light, each cycle weakening the self-cherishing thought. And then shift and think of a stranger or a group of strangers, some impression you have of people you don't know, particularly when they're in an indifferent state. Maybe at Central Station, maybe in the grocery store just make an impression of one person in a crowd, one stranger there who has that ignoring energy, that indifferent, who could not care less about the people around him if he doesn't know him. Think of a stranger. one with indifference. And let yourself notice that you don't like their ignoring quality. You don't like the way they're oblivious to those around them. Let yourself remember those times when the indifference of strangers has gotten to you. When you wish they would acknowledge other people, be civil or polite, But they're just careless, indifferent, in their own world. Remembering or manufacturing a situation like that.
and think that indifference came from the self-cherishing thought. Their self-cherishing keeps them in that bubble, keeps them oblivious. And my reaction and suffering are also from self-cherishing. Mine. And so their behavior could trigger my bad behavior, or it could trigger some sort of wisdom or antidote. So decide to take it on voluntarily. Breathe in their indifference. Breathe in their obliviousness. And give it to that hard shell covering your good heart. Breathing it in is black toxic smoke. Breathing out all of your kindness and consideration. Your sense of benevolence towards your fellow man. In black smoke, out golden light. Every cycle, softening that shell, gradually dissolving it. Warm golden light of your love radiating out. Marry these ideas to the breath. In black smoke, out golden light. Breathing in indifference, giving it to your self-cherishing. Breathing out consideration and kindness, giving it to them. And think that these three people represent all sentient beings who you categorize in this way, as well as these three poisons, anger, attachment, ignorance, from which all other afflictions flow and elaborate. And feel that you breathe in all of that, of all sentient beings, and send out so much happiness and love to all of them. And with these last few breaths of the meditation, your self-cherishing completely dissolves. Your good heart completely released, filling you, radiating out, touching all living beings, bringing them peace. Breathing in all the afflictions of all sentient beings. Breathing out happiness, love, sending it to all of them equally. Feeling yourself cherishing dissolved. Let go of the visualization and just simplify down into in breath compassion, out breath love. In breath, may they be free of suffering. Out breath, may they have happiness.
Let these two linger on your breath. Simply and quietly with your natural rhythm of breathing. and let go of awareness on the breath and anchor all of these thoughts with the thought, may all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. And we dedicate. Janchu Sancho Rimbo She Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyuchi Ke Panyam Pa Me Pa Yang Gone Gondu Pawa Sho Tony Dawa Rimbo She Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyuchi Ke Panyam Pa Me Pa Yang Okay, you can relax your attention and uh, have a look at the root verses, if you like, in the intervening weeks and uh, pick out a couple slogans that you love and see if you can remember them during the day. And I'll see you next week. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a lot of Good night. Good night. Good day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. See you next week. Yeah, see you next week. Now, um, I just want to show you how many cool resources there are for this text. Um, so Start Where You Are by Be Venerable Pema Chodron is actually on this text. And it's really good for those of you that are not familiar with Buddhist terminology. Then the one by B. Allen Wallace is great for those who enjoy a technical presentation. And then Mind Training Like the Rays of the Sun, is the one that I started with, and it has a nice Lom Rim outline way of framing it together with the commentary by Num Capel. Now these, the two on the ends are newer. These are contemporary compilations of lots of Lojong texts. So I really recommend those two if you're interested, but for just a classic Geshe style presentation, we have the one by Geshe Sonam Rinchen there in the middle. But wait, there's more. So the ones you guys have um, included in your course materials is The Kindness of Others by Geshe Jumpa Techok. And it's brilliant. It's really experiential as well as technical when it needs to be. And similar to that one are the ones by Gomo Chuku and Chogyam Trumpa.